I welcome you, uh, good afternoon, and I welcome you to session 10 of our New Horizon Final Conference. And this uh, session is dedicated to ROI and institutional change. Um, I think it already became very clear during the conference and even in the uh, session this morning that in order to uh, accomplish responsible research and innovation, institutional change is necessary on several levels, in, uh, on, in several spheres and in organizations, um, but also on the policy level. And I am very glad that we have um, a number of people uh, this afternoon who are talking about uh, institutional change and RRI from different perspectives and from these different levels. So I welcome very much Elmarie Forsberg, who will give a speech on responsible research and innovation and institutional change, perspectives from the RRI practice project. Uh, I came across this project uh, several years ago, actually in, in one of the final uh, events organized by this, uh, by this project by the RI practice project. And it was very interesting for me to see how the project not only tried to generate uh, institutional change, but also took a particular theoretical perspective on, uh, on, on, on organization theory and organ organizational change. So I am very much looking forward to learn more from Ellen Marie from this best perspective. And I hope she's uh, giving us a little glimpse on the, on the theoretical perspective, which was taken in the RR practice uh, project as well. Then we have um, Jens Orting Hansen, uh, also from Norway, and he is looking at very particular uh, uh, or, uh, organizations and institutional change there. He's looking at learning organizations, and I hope he will tell us what he understands um, uh, about uh, learning organizations and where we can find such rare species uh, of organizations because I think most of us are, uh, are working in non-learning organizations. Um, then um, I'm very happy that um, Elizabeth Frank, who's my colleague at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Anne Luba, whom I know uh, since a very long time, uh, will give us some uh, Empirical examples for institutional change uh, we experienced during the New Horizon project. And then uh, I am very happy that we have Peter Vrukovic and Mila Graurac from the University of Novi Sad in Serbia. And they are, will tell us about a very interesting pilot action which was uh, carried out in the New Horizon projects within the uh, social lab on SWARFs in which they try to implement responsible research innovation in their university, in a university setting. So I think we have a very interesting uh, presentation this uh, afternoon, uh, which look at uh, institutional change from different angles. And uh, I suggest that we, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes of presentation for each of the, uh, of the speaker, and then five minutes discussions, which will be supported by the chat. And then hopefully if everything goes well, we will have uh, 10 minutes for general discussion. Um, I would like to start with Elin Marie and your presentation and let me shortly introduce Elin Marie to you. Um, she works at the Norwegian Institute for Sustainability, Re Sustainability Research and is a uh, managing director of Ostfold Forskin and has also a minor research component at the Institute. She has a doctorate in applied ethics from the University of Oslo. Elin Marie is former head of research at the Work Research Institute at Oslo Metropolitan University, where she also built up and led the Oslo Research Group on Responsible Innovation. She coordinated the European Commission Horizon 2020 project, Responsible Research and Innovation in Practice, RI Practice. Uh, the seventh framework program project, East Frame, and other Norwegian and international projects. She has been an expert on a number of committees in Norway and internationally. Her research has mostly focused on ethics and governance of emerging technology, responsible research and innovation, agricultural and food ethics, and research ethics. El Marie, um, we are curious to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for inviting me to, to come here. Uh, it's always uh, so nice to be with the RI community. 
um, and discuss the issues that we're all engaged with. Uh, I suppose you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. With this very nice introduction, I don't need to say anything else. So um, I will just, oops, move on, hopefully. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, uh, insights from the RI practice project. Um, I'll be talking about two interrelated topics. So as you already mentioned, Eric, um, changes in research organizations as institutions and changes in academia as a higher level societal institution. And I'll be talking about both uh, deep institutional change and in incremental changes. And I think both are important. So, so the RM practice project is concluded. It was concluded in 2019. It was a SWOFS project where we made um, action plans in 22 research and conducting uh, research conducting and funding organizations in, in 12 European and non-European countries. So we were working with them very much in action research, uh, developing these plans um, and also mapping what they were doing. And uh, we were focused mainly on the organizations. Uh, so institutional change as uh, organizational change. Uh, we also did some mapping of the national level and also some analysis, but the organizations was in focus. And it's right what you said. Uh, we um, we took uh, we started out with uh, uh, neo institutional theory, uh, organizational organizational theory, especially using Richard Scott's seminal work, uh, organizations, rational, natural, and open systems uh, perspective. So basically, it was about understanding organizations, both their, their structure um, and their their cultures and the way they interact with uh, the, their environments. And uh, that was like the starting point for the uh, project and, we, and the starting point for the protocol that we used in all the countries and for the different organizations. We also used other perspectives from neo-institutional theory in analysis later in the project, uh, which we, um, for one of the results from that is the book that you see implementing RRI organizational and national conditions. So um, there's much more there than I'm going to be saying today. And so I'm just going to be uh, touching upon the, <laughs> the theory, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll also say a little bit more, but I think some perspectives that I believe are important. So, um, I'd like to start with institutional change as one of the goals for SWOFs. Um, strategic one in SWOFs was about uh, accelerating and catalyzing processes of institutional change. And they say that that part will contribute to implementing the RI keys through institutional governance changes in research funding and performing organizations in an integrated way, whatever that might mean. And they also had the SWOFs key performance indicator that was related or is related to the number of institutional change actions promoted by the program. And also they talk about package or changes, but across all or several of the of the RI keys. So that was a starting point, not only for RRI practice, but for many, many institutional RRI projects in, in SWOFs. And for our project, we reported in total 84 institutional changes. So that was like changes, actions that were carried out in the mostly in the organizations that we worked with. Uh, so here you just you can see the scheme many of you have seen it before. Um, so um, when we analyzed it a bit more, uh, the kind of best practices or changes um, that the that were mentioned uh, in the reports um, as kind of RRI actions, then we could see that uh, a lot of the actions that was talked about was like organizational units, the creation of an organizational policy, setting up of training programs, incentive programs, earmarked funding. So a lot of kind of more specific concrete actions. Um, Rea published a report in 2020, I think, 
summing up the results of uh, and achievements of, of SWOFs, um, where they say that uh, there were at that point 238 individual institutional change actions that had been or were implemented by this part of the SWOFs portfolio. Um, which surpasses the target of 100 institutional changes in beneficiaries. So, um, so at, at this point, of course, there would have been even more because there are still project reporting institutional changes. So that says something about what, what an institutional change is for, for you know, DG, RTD. Um, the problem with the term institution is that it, it, is, it has two meanings, uh, both uh, academically and also in our ordinary language. So and we can call an organization as an institution. An organization can be an institution somehow with its own norms and cultures. But an institution can also be an established law or practice like the institution of marriage or the institution of academia or research. And we talk about both these levels, and I think they're important to keep part of it, and they, they interact. So in, in the RI practice project, we work with organizations and our institutional change related to organizations. But in our recommendations at the end of the project, um, we wanted to kind of also lift it up uh, to um, the level of, uh, in, of uh, science or academia as a societal institution. So we mentioned that you need to change the incentive regime um, for allowing for an organizational culture for RI, you need to broaden the co concept of excellence and impact, for instance. So I think for many RRI people, actors, agents, we, we like to, to work at both these levels. I also quite like this model by Minsberg from 1979 about, uh, this is about research, uh, sorry, about universities. So on the left, you see a normal, a normal uh, uh, kind of idealized uh, organization, while on the right, you see a typical university and a typical university is, has a very large operating core. So a lot of the people who work there, proportionally more than in other organizations, they are the ones doing the, the core business of, of the university, which is you know, teaching and research, and that's their academic stuff. And, and the management of the university, at least earlier, was uh, smaller, and the techno structure that was supporting the research was also um, uh, organized differently. So, um, so I think for many of us who work with RRI, we, we kind of come from working with the operating core. We kind of, many of us used to work with, or do still work with RRI and biotech and, and nanotech. We work with kind of making, making uh, emerging technologies more responsive to societal values. SWOFs, in a sense, they targeted through the keys more of the higher levels so the management and the techno structures in the gender action plans and in the open access structures and then we as RRI scholars too we we call for uh, reform in academia as a, an institution and academia as an institution influences both the way that research is being done it influences the way we do our research because we are do part of a community of researchers but also influences the university boards and managers because they're also part of a global university uh, community kind of with the same norms and standards. So we want to work at all these th three levels, I think. When we call for institutional change of academia as a societal institution, I think we, I mean, we can do what we did in our practice in another RI project. We can work with single organizations. But I, if we want to change the, uh, academia as a societal institution, I think we, we need to handpick the ones that we really want to work with, like you know, ex Oxford and Cambridge and, and uh, Harvard, and, and these that are kind of globally seen as exemplary. 
because if they change, they can change the whole standard for what a good university is. We also should work with like the European University Alliance, Lero, Science Europe, the other kind of more um, institutionalizing organizations. And of course, we need to engage in this critical discussion about these overarching um, mechanisms that influence the way that um, uh, academia work as, a, a, in, as an institution, um, including international publishing houses, intellectual property rights, the global university rankings that are so important for many universities, um, etc. So my my view uh, would be to take a multi-level approach. I think that we need to work with the responsible research and innovation practices in the operating core. I think we also need to have the organizational responsiveness, uh, including the keys at higher levels in, in the system. So at, you know, among the managers and the support systems, and we need the actions on the overall societal level. So in a sense, when we talk about all the institutional changes in SWOFs, so I think they, they can still be a way to, to move forward in a sense, because these actions on training, on, on gender awareness or um, culture building related to sharing research. Okay, they're related to the keys, but they open up uh, some new discussions, and both among the researchers, the operating core, and among research managers to take into account more than simply excellence or, or autonomy. So, and I think that if we, I mean, this meets with a lot of resistance. Uh, there are people, scientists, people in general want to just go on doing what they, they do. They don't want to be met with expectations uh, from outside, but over time, there will be these incremental changes, and that's a good thing. And maybe we don't want revolutionary changes in the way we do research. We don't want to jump on any bandwagon that comes along. If we want more revolutionary changes, and we discuss that a lot in our RIO practice, I think they cannot be done there. They have to be done at the level of academia as an institution. So, and I think that it's an interesting to follow also the discussion earlier today about Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe. And I think that in in SWOS in Horizon 2020, RRI was on the organizational level, but open science was more engaging with the higher level, trying to opening open it up. And also plan S and you know, the, these are quite revolutionary uh, measures, uh, which yeah, take a lot of balls to do basically. Um, and I think that we see also tendencies in Horizon Europe to work at that level. I think there's less emphasis on the organizational level, uh, except of course the keys will remain important, like ethics and gender. Um, but we have open science, we have the missions in Horizon Europe, we have the new requirements related to excellence and impact assessments, like the gender equality plans, the do no harm principle. So, there's something going on there at the higher institutional level. But we have to note, and I was I want to say that earlier, the ERC and the EIC are still operating largely autonomous, uh, autonomously, is the way I understand it. I'm soon finishing up. Um, so, but I would say that there are nice things going on. Um, there are many remaining challenges at the level of the academia as a societal institution. Um, we have new public management, we have pub production indicators, we have the, globally comp the global competitive ethos among universities. We have the publishing industry and intellectual property rights. Horizon Europe is probably not enough. It's, a, it's good, but it's not enough. It's also a question of politics and maybe even you know, international or global politics. Do we have the institutions that are necessary to take that perspective? Um, it's very nice to hear about the, you know, the work in OECD. And so that's an, that's a good thing. Do do we need more? And and uh, and what would be our role in in kind of bringing these discussions up there and maybe also taking a proactive, <laughs> uh, forward-looking uh, uh, action. 
I would just like to say that even if maybe open science is, is a good concept for working at that higher level, uh, maybe we should... Sorry. Maybe we should um, not talk so much about RRI at that overall level, but fo still focus on what used to be RIC as kind of the core. And that's responsible practice of research and innovation. So I think that uh, we do see that in Horizon Europe, and I think we see it many places, and we have to continue to fight for that concept, which is a very important concept, and it's connected with the air dimensions, of course, and, and how to do research in a responsive way. So, yeah, I guess that was what I had to say. Thanks. Thank you very much, Elin Marie. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, open the floor for short for a short discussion. Um, <clears throat> I can see a lot of clapping hands. Um, would anybody like to ask a question? I don't see a question in the chat. No questions. Well, then I will ask a question. I have several questions. Um, I, I, I thought it was very interesting to see your, your, these two graphics in, uh, of Minsberg, uh, which you showed us in your presentation, uh, which, um, which we are not so much aware of that, uh, that academia, that the research institutes are very particular organizations, different from others. And, I, I'm, and on the other hand, I have the feeling and also the experience that our research organizations are also changing very dramatically and becoming more and more our organizations like all the others. So um, did you, does this have any consequences for implementing responsible research and innovation in your experience? Hmm. Mm, I think you're right in uh, that research organizations are changing and uh, there is a uh, there is more leadership now in the academic sector than it used to be and that's called for and also by us <laughs> uh, still i think that so i think there's that means that there is more to work with for in an ri perspective you know you can you can actually um have more expectations and and do more steering of the way that research uh, is being conducted. But it meets with a lot of resistance, which can explain a lot of the resistance that we meet when we're out there working with the organization, working with researchers, and we hear over and over again the frustration, you know, oh, here, another bureaucratic thing you want us to do, you know, why can't we just focus on doing proper science? So I think that culture is still there very much so, even though there is a kind of a movement Towards, towards, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, great talk. Uh, thank you, Elin Marie. Is there any chance of institutional change, not just into organizations, but also in the institutional field? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. I, and, and as I said, I think like the European University Alliance and uh, and Science Europe, there are many ways we we can work towards these organizations. They have ears; they're they're listening and they are also engaging if we invite them. And also, they re they are responding to numerous pressures in the environment, not just from the RI community, which I think is not a very strong pressure, but there are pressures uh, from the con the whole context now, and especially regarding you know the. The missions and solving societal problems, you know, climate change and all of that, which really put some pressures on the, on the universities uh, and the, on the institutions. And now with COVID, for instance, also, it's going to change at, at that level, absolutely. So, in a sense, that uh, it's a it's a good thing. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, is there any other question? Because otherwise, I would. Uh, like to uh, continue with our next speaker, uh, with uh, Jens Orden Hansen, and he's going to talk about, as I already said, RRI and the learning organization. Um, Jens is senior researcher at Nordland Research Institute in Norway. 
He holds a doctoral degree in international management from University of Outkar. His research interests include corporate governance, corporate finance, regional development, responsible research and innovation, and organization studies. So a very interesting combination. He has taught, uh, uh, taught finance, economics, and accounting at business schools and universities in Denmark, China, and Vietnam. At Nordland Research Institute, he works on several Horizon 2020 funded projects focusing on RI and regional development. Jens, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Eric. So, yeah, I think you mentioned I'm from Norway. Actually, I'm from Denmark, but I have been living in Norway for a few years now, working at Northern Research Institute. Uh, let me try to share my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect, Jens. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm going to talk about RI and the learning organization. So I assume that uh, most of the people who are attending this, they already are familiar with RI, but maybe not so much with the learning organization. So I will talk a little bit about what that is. So what I'm going to do is, um, to present a paper that uh, that I published last year together with uh, two colleagues from Northern Research Institute, uh, Nina Nguyen and Ade Jensen, who uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Nina, who is the coordinator of the Siri project that I also work in. You can see the Siri logo on my uh, on my slides. So I'm going to present that paper and then offer some general reflections on the relationship between RI and the learning organization. So this is uh, the paper, which, by the way, has uh, open access. So you are more than welcome to download this paper and read it if you're interested. So uh, this uh, article is titled The Responsible Learning Organization. Can Seng 1990 teach organizations how to become responsible innovators? So Seng 1990 refers to a book that was published in 1990, Peter Seng an American researcher, it's called The Fifth Discipline, which was the book that sort of launched the concept of the learning organization into the mainstream. So the learning organization became a very popular topic in the 1990s. We don't hear that much about it anymore, I think, and there can be different reasons for that, which I will get uh, back to later. But the research question is, does being a learning organization facilitate the practice of responsible research and innovation. So if you are an LO, a learning organization, will it be easier for you then to do RI or will you be more likely to do RI? And why is that an interesting question? Well, first of all, in the literature on RI, we still lack knowledge about the organizational characteristics that facilitate RI. So it's easy for researchers like us to tell people they should do RI, but um, maybe it's not that easy for them to do, or maybe they are not very motivated to do it. And that will differ probably from organization to organization. So it's interesting to find out what, uh, what are the organizational characteristics that facilitate RI. And secondly, if there is in fact a link between the LO and RI, so that one supports the other, that will strengthen the case for both of them, right? So uh, this will create an additional incentive for organizations to try to become an LO. And it also provides an extra motivation for uh, practicing RI because allegedly being a, a learning organization is also good for business. This is something I'll get back to very soon. So this suggests that if there is a link between the LO and RI, then maybe practicing RI is also good for business. And that would be very interesting. That would make it much easier for policymakers to promote the concept of RI to, to for-profit companies. 
the methodology in this paper is, is very simple. We, we don't have any particularly fancy methodology. We take the concepts, it's a conceptual paper. We take the concept of the learning organization and RI, and then we find in the existing literature some um, analysis of both, where they are broken down into component parts. And then we go through each component of the learning organization and try to analyze how it's connected to the components of RI. And the learning organization has been defined in many ways by many people. As I said, we focus here on um, this seminal book by Peter Singh, The Fifth Discipline, from uh, 1990. And according to Peter Singh, a learning organization is characterized by having mastered five disciplines. And the one I list first here is actually the fifth one. The book is named after it, The Fifth Discipline. I just listed first because it's considered the most important. So the first one is uh, systems thinking. Uh, so this, uh, of course, I don't have time to go into detail about these, but I will very briefly introduce them. The systems thinking is uh, kind of thinking where you emphasize the connectedness of uh, actors and um, and you uh, focus on how to how things work together collectively. Personal mastery, is the second one. So that is at the individual level, where in learning organizations, the individuals um, try to continuously uh, improve themselves and scrutinize themselves and um, um, identify how they, oops, how they, how they can um, uh, motivate themselves to do the best possible job in the organization, things like that. Third one, mental models. So this refers to the assumptions that exist in an organization about the world, how the world works. And these tend to become outdated. So that is a problem for organizations. A learning organization is one in which the employees will discuss this and uh, share their understanding of, uh, of, um, of how the world works and thereby uh, learn together. Fourth one is shared vision. So according to saying, if uh, employees or members of an organization have a shared vision to work towards, that has a very powerful motivational effect. So, and that is one of the prerequisites for becoming a learning organization. Last one is team learning. So saying emphasizes the distinction between individual learning and team learning. And he says that it's essential for organizational members to practice team learning, where they engage in dialogue with each other and learn through a collective uh, process. So that is uh, briefly what the learning organization is about, according to Peter Singh. And why would you become a learning organization? Well, in the book, uh, the main thing that um, saying points out is that being a learning organization is important in order for you to be competitive in the marketplace. So this is a book that was written primarily for, uh, for practitioners from their business sector. But in addition to that, a learning organization is also a great place for employees to work. So Basically, in Seng's um, conceptualization of the LO, everybody wins. It's basically good for everybody. And that has been challenged by some skeptics, but I will not go into that right now. I'll move on to the concept of RI, which I'm sure you all know. Um, so in general, RI is uh, research and innovation that is aligned with the values and needs of society. But there are different ways of, um, of breaking it down into component parts. We use one that has been widely cited in the RI literature, uh, which originates from uh, Stilgo in 2013, where RI consists of four parts, uh, inclusion, anticipation, responsiveness, and uh, reflexivity. And we are probably familiar with, with these concepts. So inclusion means you need to engage a wide range of stakeholders or interested uh, people. 
Anticipation means you need to look to the future, anticipate the possible harmful effects of your actions. Responsiveness means you need to be quick to uh, respond to new information, for example, related to harmful effects of your research. And finally, reflexivity means that you should continuously engage in critical self-reflection and identify errors in what you're doing and what you can do differently and things like that. So what I'm going to do now and what we do in the paper is to go through the elements of the ELO, the learning organization, and think about how that relates to RI. The first one is systems thinking. And here we see a very strong connection to RI because the RI literature strongly emphasizes the interconnectedness of actors. Um, there, there's a link to system thinking basically in all the RI dimensions. But there is one important difference to the LO, and that is that the LO, of course, focuses on the organization itself. So a learning organization as a system. In RI, the focus is more on uh, ecosystems, right? So the way that different actors have to uh, work together. But there is definitely a strong connection to RI. Personal mastery, also a connection to RI, in particular with reflexivity. There's a lot of resemblance in the way that um, Peter Seng describes this discipline of personal mastery um, and how the RI literature emphasizes how you need to continuously scrutinize uh, your own actions, um, which is the reflexivity uh, dimension. Mental models, here we also have strong connection to RI, which is quite obvious if you compare uh, what Seng writes about mental models with what you see in the RI literature. In particular, uh, reflexivity, where you have to scrutinize your mental models according to RI. Also inclusion, where RI emphasizes that you need to include a wide range of stakeholders so that you can enrich your own uh, worldview by understanding how other people see the world. And that is also what uh, Seng emphasizes, except that he does it within an organization. But conceptually, there's a strong connection. Shared vision. Now, this is one where you might think there is a very strong connection to RI. And I would say there is, but actually, if you look at the RI literature, there's not that much focus on shared vision. It's more, it tends to be a little bit less ambitious. Uh, it's more about how we can find compromises between the interests of different actors in society. But I have to say that personally, having worked in, uh, in an RI uh, Horizon project, uh, Siri, uh, we very much emphasized uh, shared vision as our approach to RI, bringing stakeholders together at workshops, working on a shared vision for the region of here in, in Norland, in Norway. So I personally see a strong connection between shared vision as described by Peter Singh and uh, our own approach to RI in the Siri project. Because RI requires a shared vision of what is good for society. And then finally, we have a uh, team learning where there is some connection to RI. RI obviously emphasizes continuous learning. Again, the emphasis is on learning with stakeholders or outsiders, whereas in the learning organizations, most of the learning is supposed to take place inside the organization. Okay, so that was a brief introduction to what we found in our paper. So the main conclusion here is that, at least in theory, being a learning organization should make it easier to practice RI. In fact, there are some strong overlaps between uh, the LO and RI that is actually, being an L LO by definition is RI in some respects. But the main deviation, which I mentioned before, is that the RI or the LO focuses on one organization the RI literature focuses on ecosystems. I have a couple of reflections here at the end. So 
when uh, the learning organization concept became popular in the 1990s, it was promoted by a lot of management consultants who wanted to help companies become better at dealing with change and be more competitive. It seems that that uh, does not happen so much anymore. The concept of learning organization is not heard as often. I think partly that's because there are other concepts that have appeared since then, which cover some of the same territory. Concepts like um, agility or total quality management or uh, uh, social networks, uh, things like that. So. To some extent, I think the ideas still exist, but they have been given different labels. But it's also striking, this is something we found in, in our research on the learning organization, that in the literature today, the learning organization tends to, um, most of the, of the articles that appear, at least in, um, in Norway or this part of the world, is they focus on nonprofit organizations. So they focus on uh, government uh, organizations or uh, schools or uh, churches and things like that. So if you combine that with what I've just presented today about RI, could it be maybe that the learning organization concept is, is real, it's valuable, but maybe not for profits, but maybe the real value of this concept is that the learning organizations can can be a responsible and ethical organization. Maybe that's what the LO is actually good for. So that's one idea. Another reflection I have is, could it be that both of these concepts are motivated by the same wishful thinking? And that's why we see so many overlaps because it's very uh, tempting to assume that if you if you introduce some democratic ideals into organizations or ecosystems where people work together and they have dialogue and so on, that will be good for everybody. But maybe in some cases, the costs of those activities are not justified from a business perspective, maybe. Now, if that is the case, then we are stuck with the problem of how to motivate people to practice RI. Uh, we have to find other ways to do that. Partly we can appeal to their conscience, we probably need more. Um, so that is an interesting topic for the future. So this is my presentation, thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, there has been almost no question in the in the chat, which is an indicator that people were really listening to what you have said and had to say. Um, please, uh, I would like to um, motivate you uh, to ask questions uh, to Jens about responsible research innovation uh, at the learning organization. Are there any questions? So again, we have Leonardo asking questions in the chat. Thank you. Very interesting topic. In Senge perspective, organizations learn by the competitive motivation of markets. When we talk about government agencies doing research, what, uh, what would be the motivation of organizational change guided by learning? Ethics or what kind of other motivation? Thank you. Yes. Um... This is a very interesting question. I, I guess I touched on it uh, to some extent during my presentation that it's absolutely right what uh, Leonardo is saying, that saying, and also the other, most of the other early proponents of the learning organization, they emphasize the need to compete. So you will become more competitive. You can react faster to change if you become a learning organization. And I think that um, I have often heard in the uh, RI debate, I have often heard it mentioned that companies should practice RI because it's good for them in the long run. Um, the question is to what extent uh, that is true. I don't think we can rely entirely on appealing to the profit uh, motive 
in in motivating organizations to do RI. I think yes, uh, ethics is what Leonardo uh, mentioned. We need um, we need certainly an appeal to uh, ethics, but we also need to um, use the government, uh, the tools available to governments to create incentives for organizations to make it more, uh, to, to motivate them to practice RI. I don't think there's any way around that. Thank you very much, Jens. Um, Robert Gianni raised his hand and Sophie uh, Fösleitner asked a question. And Robert informed us that it's the same question that Sophie has. So maybe we can integrate that by Robert Gianni asking the question of Sophie. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I thank you for your presentation, Jens. I think it was very, very interesting and informing and uh, made me reflect a lot. And I, I was wondering, because of course, this is the, I think that's the main problem of RI in a way, you know, like, uh, you can address this question at different levels. You can say it's like, what does it mean to be responsible? No, but you address it from the from the broader sense. What is good for society? And, and you rightly said we need to like at least uh, let's say work towards uh, a shared vision of what's good for society. But I'm also wondering. Uh, I'm sorry for being provocative, but uh, I live in Brussels, and I, I, I often face all these uh, council meetings where all these prime ministers struggle and uh, kind of fight over uh, even petty issues, uh, not to talk about European people themselves. They're always like in a clash for different kind of values, interests, uh, normative approaches as well. So I was wondering if uh, it's, in your opinion, it would be easier to reach this kind of uh, shared vision learning organization than it is in actual society maybe learning organization have some kind of more refined approach to to come to a consensus than uh, than other uh, institutions or, or normal society okay. absolutely uh, i definitely think that is the case and i also i don't know how how clearly i expressed it in the presentation but actually if you read the read our paper we this particular element of the learning organization, the shared vision is actually where we find the, the um, most tenuous connection or the weakest connection uh, to RI. And uh, there's no doubt that, as you said, I mean, in, in an organization, a limited number of people who work together towards some goal, they, maybe you can create a shared vision, but it's much harder across a huge ecosystem of disparate yeah. actors with different values. Um, yeah, and therefore so, maybe mm. raises the, also the issues of uh, being representative of society in a way, no? Mm. Also puzzles me that, yeah. Mm. So I think, and that's why I think the literature on RI also focuses more on on uh, finding good uh, compromises between different interests in society. But having said that, as, as I mentioned, I think it was in our work in the Siri project, I think it was motivating for the stakeholders when they got together and they actually tried to define some kind of shared vision for the region. I think that motivated them to continue with the, with the, um, with the stakeholder engagement process we have in Siri. Yeah. And so I think, I think if I may add on this, I think it's also interesting just to, my opinion, it's also interesting that you implicitly pointed at the fact that uh, we we all do, I think, in the RI community that the construction of consensus, you know, the construction of something that is shared is also what, uh, in a way, generates this shared, uh, and, you know, the, the process mm. generates this shared. Uh, this shared mm. you know, I think we all trying to point at that. If, if the process is more inclusive, then uh, it's more easier to, to, to get a shared perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Thank you I very much. I, I hope Sophie point as well, though, and eh? we and I want to ask Sophie if she agrees on my formula. I think this is something we definitely have to do, but I would rather like to do this at the end of our, of our session because we have to move on, and I apologize for uh, not having so giving Sophie now the time to to ask her question. Um, I would like to continue with the uh, the next presentation um, by Elisabeth Frankus and Anne Luba on their experiences from the New Horizon project. Elisabeth Frankus is sociologist and educationalist. She has been working as a senior researcher at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Vienna since 2015, where she's intensively engaged in participative methods in the field of digitalization.
In addition to her work in the scientific field, her professional experience also includes the education sector as a project manager, trainer and coach, where she created and tested analog and digital learning materials together with different uh, target groups, especially in European projects. Since 2013, Elisabeth Frankus has been teaching at various universities in Vienna. Anne Luber is an associate professor in governance and sustainability at the Athena Institute Freie Universiteit Amsterdam and in the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. Her research explores the relation between knowledge, power and agency in the governance of highly complex societal issues. Insights in how knowledge co-creation and policy co-design will trigger reflexivity and learning she translate into methodological innovative approaches to policy analysis and evaluation. Anne Luba holds a PhD in political science based on a thesis on interactive technology assessment and its potential contribution to making the sustainable development concept operational in public policy and business. She is also co-editor of a book on sustainability transition in agriculture and food. Anne and Elizabeth, I'm looking forward to listen to you. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, I just want to mention that, Mer that Eric is also part of our, our team and he also uh, prepared our presentation, which we will now present. So I will try to share my screen. Does it work? Uh, you send, so, hmm? you send a mode, so go to display settings and change it there. Better? Perfect, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about some uh, learnings we made in uh, the New Horizon project. And it is about learning on our eyes, especially our, on our experiences in the social labs. And that's why all the, the results I'm presenting here um, connected to the social labs um, uh, build also on the experience uh, of our colleagues who are also part of in the New Horizon project mentioned here in the, in the first slide. So um, the New Horizon uh, project's objective is to promote the uptake of our eye in age 2020. And we want to know if um, if the results um, of, of th this project's effort um, somehow take take up our eye or can are opening up for learning uh, regarding our eye, and we did this uh, within 15 social labs. So we developed 15 social labs within the project and conducted all together 59 uh, pilot actions. Uh, but before this, we imp uh, we conducted assessment and diagnosis of uh, RRI per subsection to know what are the barriers and opportunities for RRI in this in the single subsections, and how can we take them up in in, in the pilot actions. So we say that learning uh, or institutional change requires a revision of core beliefs and as associated practices, which means, first of all, we of course have to know what are, the, what are the core beliefs and where can we start for the change process. And there are two levels. First of all, the individual level, where we develop pilot actions in line with our eye and social labs. And then we would like to change the core beliefs or um, at least to, to, to change them to a little, to a little amount um, of the organizations responsible for the H 2020 subsections addressed. So for this presentation, for this, um, for this analysis, we, we selected five case studies five uh, social labs, so to say, out of the 19th. Um, and we selected five organizations, um, because these five organizations, because they vary a little bit compared to the other subsections. Um, they, um, four of them can be understood as organizations with their own status, uh, which is ERC, EIT, GRC, Eurotom. I will present them a little bit later. 
And Marie Curie uh, it is again a little bit different. It has a responsibility of the DG education, youth, sport, um, and implementation research ex executive agency. We have several research questions. Maybe we have too, too many, but uh, this is what we are interested in. So first of all, we would like to know to, to what extent is the concept of RRI already in known in in this uh, this five uh, research areas research lines, and what are the organization's core beliefs and objectives, as mentioned before, so that we know where to where to start uh, to define barriers or obstacles uh, to overcome with the help of RRI. Um, another research question is how did the social labs deal with the opportunities and barriers towards RRI? So more on a practical level and did the pilot actions induce learning by learning organizations out of their comfort zone um, and I will will tell you later on what we mean by this and finally how did the organizations respond to, to the social lab to the pilot actions um, at the end or maybe a little bit after the social labs we just we, had, we were just finishing most of them in, in, the, in the current uh, months so was RI uptake promoted via learning process induced by social labs and pilot actions? We will see if we find if we, if we will find an answer in this presentation. So these are our five cases, our five um, research lines. First of all, the European Research Council. Uh, it aims to encourage the highest quality research in Europe through competitive funding and to support investigator-driven frontier research across all fields on the basis of scientific excellence. Then Marie Curie, which stands for Marie Skotlovska Curie Actions, um, it uh, improves the, or tries to improve the mobility to further the careers of excellent researchers, increasing exchange of scientific personnel between European uh, knowledge institutes and private firms. Then we have, we also took the European Institute of Innovation and Technology with its KICS. Uh, KICS stands for Knowledge and Innovation Communities. Um, here, the education of entrepreneurs is very important, developing products and services, and also establishing startups uh, with the help of the knowledge of these centers, of these kicks, uh, between educators, researchers, and innovators. Another case is Eurotom, which is uh, promoting research on nuclear energy and is establishing uniform safety standards. And finally, JRC, which is um, the Joint Research Center. Uh, it is supporting European policies with scientific evidence. So what we did in the first step was to gather in enough information from these five cases to, uh, to answer the question, to what extent did the organization incorporate the concept of RI before the social lab? So how was it known? And we can see that, for example, in ERC, the term was never used, but some some part of or some keys were already implemented, especially uh, gender and ethics uh, issues. In Marie Curie, more or less the same. The term or the concept was not known as such, but it was recognized at the Marie Curie unit that is very relevant and that it is, um, at least to some extent, reflecting the standing practices of Marie Curie. In EIT, uh, it turned out that there are already some strong RI elements present, so they already apply um, the, the RRI keys, but they don't, they don't call it um, in the same way, or they don't call it a RRI concept. In Eurotom, the concept was also unknown. There was some um, um, work done related to gender or yeah, to gender issues and open access, but there was also or still is a big fear in including the public, involving the public in open discussions. Um, and in the GSC, the concept was also not known, but there were some similar approaches um, to the keys, such as citizens. Uh, engagement, uh, democratic approaches, and also 
the necessity of intern transdisciplinarity. So what about the core beliefs and objectives of the organizations, their main uh, goals and purposes, and how, how can we uh, connect them to barriers to our defined barriers um, related to RRI out of these core beliefs? We start again with the uh, ERC, which uh, has the core belief of autonomy of researchers, um, and it is the aim to, or the, the, the main goal is scientific excellence for its own sake, with, with probably also some breakthrough innovations. Marie Curie um, wants to make a learning environment out of the whole world, so everybody and everywhere sh learning should be, a, should be possible, encouraging collaborations and sharing of ideas, especially among researchers. The EIT can be understood as an, or it, it, um, it understands itself as an incubator for the networks of educators, researchers, innovators, and, and has also a high degree of autonomy. Um, one of the most important uh, goal, goals is to address the societal challenges and also to have enough financial sustainability of the, of the KICS operations. Eurotom uh, wants to create uh, the, the necessary conditions for, uh, for safety and for nuclear industries. Therefore, nuclear research has to be promoted. This is one of the the purpose of this research um, line. And GSC supports the EC policy through knowledge creation as an independent knowledge broker. Um, and the, the idea is to contribute to economic growth, a healthy and safe environment, secure energy supplies, sustainable mobility and consumer protections. And now I already hand over to my colleague Anne. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, let me continue here. So the question then is, how did the social apps deal with the situation they encountered, this uh, level of uptake or endorsement of RI and the uh, core beliefs that we found present in the organizations that the New Horizon project um, basically addressed? Um, well, interestingly, all five selected labs developed a different strategy, um, ERC and uh, AIT. They focused, uh, particularly in the social labs, uh, on the level of individuals. So, on the level of the individuals, participants um, finding highly motivated and interested researchers, but avoiding consciously or, well, on a practical level, um, addressing or trying to uh, bring on board higher levels of these organizations. So that was um, uh, their particular approach, which those two have in common. Um, in Marie Curie, uh, also the uh, uh, focus was initially on the, on the members of the social lab. Um, but uh, in contrast to ERC and AIT, um, those were selected not only because they were highly motivated, but also because of their, uh, you could say, activist approach. They, they already had many of those, um, of them, uh, a, a change agenda. So what the lab tried to do was enhance their sense of agency and help them identify opportunities to anchor their ideas and their pilot actions. Um, so actually work as change agents. Now, that was again, a different approach from Euratom, uh, sorry, from yeah, Euratom and GRC, which uh, are completely different, but they both developed a strategy by taking up some issue that struck a chord with the organization's agenda. For Eurotom, that was by exploring awareness about the public image of nuclear energy. And for GRC, that was by focusing on stakeholder engagement, which was on the agenda of, of the organization, as it were. But then that raises the question, um, if that is a strategy, how then did, if at all, the social labs, the Project New Horizon, 
help to increase uptake beyond what was already going on. And so, um, Elizabeth, if you could move on. Um, and, and the answer to that question, did these pilot actions or uh, the social lab as such induce learning um, among the organizations and those involved by uh, moving the organization outside of their comfort zone by trying to broaden their views, including those uh, already um, addressed, which would be able to capture on an RI label and to really make a change. Well, the uh, blunt answer for ERC and AIT, um, uh, sorry, for A ARC is no. Um, there was no way that the ERC Council or higher um, organizational levels were interested at all in this. So no, that wasn't the case. Whereas interestingly for Marie Curie, it was. Um, it's interesting because both are uh, units, or sorry, subsections in the excellent science pillar and both um, lines of, of research funding share some basic core beliefs, but still there was quite a difference um, and in the case of Marie Curie, um, there was a challenging and a reformulation of key concepts in its policies. Um, among them, the concept of excellence. Uh, also, like um, uh, Anna Marie uh, Vosberg already said, um, uh, and influence probably of, of wider developments like research culture, etc. Uh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was a, a quite a change. And for the other three, it's sort of a mixed bag um, results, more or less, yes or no. And so the question then is, did it work? Um, this luring out of comfort zone, Elizabeth, I'm just moving on to my final slides. Um, well, the answer here is no in the case of ERC and ART. There was a full rejection, uh, as I said already, ERC for um, uh, principle, on principle grounds, whereas the IT said, well, we're just not going to move. It's, it has no particular added value. Um, in the case of Marie Curie and um, uh, uh, Euratom, there was some movement there, definitely. Um, in the case of Eurotom, however, it was argued that it would be an add-on, an additional effort, which would require additional money. And there it came to a full stop. Whereas in the case of Marie Curie, we observe dynamics developing towards what we'd call, we would call uh, RI-oriented um, change. And in the case of GRC, what we see is that there was first rejection and then cooperation, but that we understand as coming particularly because there was already a change, a uh, process of organizational change ongoing, and it fitted uh, in its um, new agenda. So that brings me to the conclusions. What can we make out of this very mixed picture of uptake um, in Marie Curie and in DRC? And, a very strong refusion or very limited uptake in the other three. Well, we find that the success, first of all, is really determined by the extent to which there is an alignment between RI and organization core beliefs. So this pertains too to what was just presented uh, previously on the learning organization and depends very much on the core beliefs. Um, and in case of a conflict, there was just no way to move forward, or so it seems. What we see, and that's my final, uh, what I want to share with you on behalf of us all, is um, that pilot actions and social labs did succeed in inducing RI-oriented learning. Um, also in the case of a mismatch between those core beliefs and uh, RI, particularly on the level of the individuals of involved. Of course, that had a bias that those involved were those motivated for change, but we could argue, or we, well, we propose to you, we might argue that that too is a way to, um, well, produce incremental change on the level of the organizations, again, as was shared earlier 
in university contexts, for instance. Uh, and we found that that works if strategies were not threatening. So it was really luring people out of their comfort zone, focusing on incremental changes and on responsive approaches to discussing RI. And if the strategies that were employed focused on anchoring and embedding pilot actions in standing practices and um, uh, rules and regulations. And that was what we want to share with you. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, we have one question uh, from Leonardo again. Uh, great conversation. Uh, what kind of, sorry, now I'm losing it. Um, what kind of methodolo methodological approach was used to identify core shared beliefs at the organization level and validate them? Any suggestion for further research on the topic of core beliefs? Thank you both. Uh, if I, yeah, yeah. Uh, what we did is we took into account core beliefs in what as a whole consortium we did was the diagnosis. So we um, systematically reviewed uh, policy documents and uh, subsection documents from uh, program level documents to call level and evaluate the uh, evaluation um, um, uh, criteria and we uh, did a whole range of interviews not just us or you know colleagues here presenting but the whole consortium interviews with people involved and then it was a matter of content analysis to bring out um, core um, beliefs but yes definitely it can be done uh, probably um, from uh, 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 ACF perspective or something like advocacy coalition framework perspective. We didn't do that. I don't know if you have suggestions, that would be great, Elena. Maybe just to do, uh, one thing in addition, during the social labs, it was also sometimes uh, interesting to see the core beliefs. So um, depending on, on, the, on how people behaved and what, uh, what uh, the discussions were about, uh, it was also um, possible to, to identify a little bit more the core beliefs or to make them more vivid. Thank you very much, Anne and Elizabeth. Uh, I don't know whether why plans never work out. Uh, we are still uh, we are short on time. I, I hope uh, you uh, agree with me that we add another 10 minutes if this is okay to give our last speakers enough time to present uh, their experiences. And I welcome uh, Mila Krahovac. Uh, who is an associate professor at the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Novi Sad in Serbia. Although her main field of expertise is phytopathology and biolo biolo biological and other alternative tools for plant disease management, from 2018 on, she is actively involved in responsible research and innovation, particularly in gender equality and public engagement in research performing organizations. She's working on integrating gender equality and public engagement at institutional level of the Faculty of Agriculture, as well as in her primary scientific activities within phytopathology. Peter Varkovic is an associate professor at the Faculty of Technical Sciences, University of Novi Sad. With a background in psychology and a PhD in engineering management, he is interested in researching human aspects of production processes, communication, conflict management, creativity management, and networking with open innovation. He is especially passionate about empowering SMEs in developing countries to collaborate and synergize, and he also frequently acts as a workshop facilitator in events that ask for cooperation, interdisciplinary approach, and open dialogue. I'm looking forward to hear from you about your experiences with implementing responsible research and, and innovation in your university. Thank you, Eric, so much. And it's so challenging to be the, the last part of, of uh, afternoon session. And we will stay brief and also be uh, on spot uh, with this. Uh, we do not uh, have any kind of uh, slides, so uh, we will have your full attention. So um, uh, in, in our case, in the University of Novi Sade in Serbia, 
uh, since it is a really uh, large university with almost 5,000 uh, academic employees, uh, and uh, since it is not an uh, integrated university, uh, there was a challenge on uh, how to is, uh, is put uh, RRI into institutional practices, since it is a really a new term uh, for us. Uh, for this case, um, uh, it, it was somehow natural to pick one institution and uh, do, which was already interested in, in this approach and to observe their um, um, experiences. Uh, I will also, Eric, uh, point that uh, we, uh, uh, this pilot is actually a result of two uh, social labs in the New Horizon projects. One of them being, as you mentioned in the introduction section, the SWAFs uh, social lab, but the other one is also the excellence and widening participation, uh, for, uh, which was led by uh, Technalia uh, in Barcelona. So we were, uh, we were actually confronted from two sides to hear about this. And uh, the second uh, interesting uh, point is that uh, the results of this pilot from New Horizon projects were then transferred to another Horizon projects called the CoChange, to continue the change, uh, with, uh, institutional change, and to bring uh, more experiences about it. So uh, I will uh, now leave the floor to my colleague Mila from uh, Faculty of Agriculture, in uh, which which has shown a tremendous um, success in, in, in uh, institutional change in implementing MRI. Mila, please continue. Thank you, Peter. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad I have the opportunity to share our, although still very modest experience with RRI and institutional changes that are currently happening at our faculty. And we hope will happen at the university level as well. Uh, I must confess that we were not familiar with the existence of RRI principle at the time changes were initiated at our faculty, that was in 2018, as well as most of the staff at our university. Uh, however, it, uh, things started to change and today we can say we are taking tiny but sure steps towards institutional changes. So, how it all began? Uh, well, uh, from my standpoint, it looked the way I'm about to explain to you. However, uh, I guess there were a few primary steps I probably was not aware then and I'm still not aware of today. Uh, but the first time I heard about RRI was when I received an email from our Vice Dean for Science and International Cooperation. Uh, suggesting that I've been proposed to be part of our RI group that will work on gender equality issues at our faculty. Uh, this came as a complete uh, surprise to me and uh, also as a bit of a burden uh, concerning that I, as all other involved colleagues, was piled up with other work regarding projects, teaching, commercial activities, etc. So we were already quite busy with our basic research we do. Uh, however, today I'm more than grateful for being given this opportunity uh, because not only did it enable me to actively affect the issues that greatly influence my work, uh, but also improved all other activities I am professionally involved in. So not to make this a personal uh, experience, uh, the invited colleagues meet, met actually at the scheduled meeting and our vice dean Branko Čupina and our colleague Branislav Alalic gave us a short explanation about RRI and informed us that the initiative for RRI team constituting came to, from one project named Serbia for Excel coordinated by Branislav Alalic and also from the necessity for institutional changes. Uh, the results of this meeting were that RRI team was formed at our faculty in April 2018. It had seven members and it covered, uh, it had an idea of covering several RRI keys uh, with one person being responsible for each of the keys. So we covered science education, ethics, governance, gender equality, public engagement, and uh, open access. 
we actually added one more uh, key we wanted to, to target, and that was generation issue and communication problems. This is something actually we felt that is maybe missing in RRI concept, and that is that was in our case very important. So this was a top-down approach where we were given a not so specified task with absolutely no instructions how to realize actually uh, the task. Uh, it was supported and could rely only on the goodwill of the persons involved. Uh, so in the following period, um, about six months, uh, each team member had a task to make the analysis of the current state of the RRI aspect they cover at the faculty and to propose some points that uh, should be improved in the future on institutional level. Uh, at this point, uh, I must confess, most of us uh, were stuck with the question, okay, we did the analysis, and uh, now what? What is our next step? How can we make managers, policy makers aware of the weak points we detected? And how can we change anything at institutional level? How is it done? We are not educated, we are not qualified to do that job. And at the end, who is going to finance all that work? Uh, and we were still not so familiar with the actual purpose of RRI. Although there were a few examples of active, active practicing RRI principles at our faculty, particularly in the field of public engagement, but without awareness that, that is actually RRI. So we were practicing some aspects, but we just didn't call it RRI. Uh, then I would say the milestone in this whole process happened, and that was something Peter already mentioned, a social lab held in Prague in November 2018, uh, where we had the opportunity actually to share our experience and to get some answers on how to proceed. Uh, for me, the most valuable advices uh, I brought home from this social lab were not to give up and that uh, small steps actually count because all the time we had a feeling that we, we didn't do a, a big thing and I still truly believe that this brought us where we are today. Uh, also some methodologies and techniques regarding dialogue, uh, public engagement and gender equality were introduced to us which greatly affected our future work as we implemented them in our future activities. Uh, therefore, we offered to host the next social lab in Serbia, in Novi Sad. And after Prague, uh, we were very lucky and became partners on submitted co-change project proposal. And we received really good news. The project was approved in July 2019. So the next social lab was organized in Novi Sad in October. And in this lab, we actually deepened our knowledge on RRI and its dimensions through evaluation of the pilot actions. And at this point, the things actually started to grow at our faculty, especially the motivation to engage and to persist on the path to try to make change uh, in people's minds and not only in people's minds, but also at institutional level. Uh, so the idea of RRI started to spread uh, in personal communication with colleagues and among colleagues, but also at each opportunity where RRI team members were publicly engaged. So we started spreading the idea of, of RRI. And the next milestone certainly was start and active work on co-change project activities. Uh, not only that given tasks planned by the project were driving force for further, deeper analysis of gender equality, open access, uh, scientific education and public engagement at our faculty, uh, but also the fact that our activities got organized, systematized and professional as well as financial support. That was something that we needed to go further in our activities. So. Uh, the top-down approach, the call from the vice dean saying that we should do something on gender activity, gender equality or science education or open access was a good start, but it wasn't sustainable in that way. Uh, several people from RRI team didn't go beyond the first given task, so just they just did the analysis of certain keys and that is where they 
stopped. And that happened because of the lack of time and motivation, but also because of the lack of the experienced support. Uh, the pandemic also certainly slowed down the, and reduced the extent and form of our planned activities, uh, but we are still very satisfied uh, with the obtained results and our future plans. Uh, we managed to organize dialogues, live dialogues, with our colleagues regarding gender equality. And we once more detected some weak points that uh, were previously defined by analysis based on the formal data. And we got to the point where we realized that pure number of male, female analysis doesn't always give us the true picture of the gender equality state. Uh, so the dialogues actually greatly directed our future activities as well as uh, drafting the survey we planned to do uh, regarding gender equality. So all those activities actually uh, trigger, triggered institutional change, which is now underway. So gender equality board is currently being constituted at our faculty and a significant task for them is planned and that is to draft gender equality plan based on the results of the analysis of the conducted survey. And gender equality plan is actually the document our faculty is currently missing and this is a significant obstacle for us in project proposals. So we hope we will uh, get this document ready and that will be a first institutional change uh, for us. Also, we actually saw that ethical procedures uh, are well developed and uh, good functioning at our faculty. Uh, so our third party on the project, and that is Institute of Food Technology, is now trying to establish the same model at their institution, which is part of the same uh, university as our faculty. And we are supporting them and helping them in this process. Also, they're actively following our work regarding gender equality board and plan, using it as a showcase and also trying to establish the same changes at their institution. Uh, we are also currently testing some open access repositories at our faculty and planning to make changes at uh, this level also uh, to define recommendations for a new platform for publishing textbooks in open access. So, Generally, in this whole process, uh, we notice that specific stories and uh, contextual examples yield much better results than just the general talks about responsibility. And I must say, uh, because I'm, I come from natural scientists, uh, sciences, uh, that this is particularly true when scientists of na natural sciences are involved in the process of institutionalizing our right. So basically, this was our experience in short. Uh, I would now go back to Petr Vrgovic, who is our great support in the mentioned process and who has a vision to share our experiences beyond Faculty of Agriculture, so at the university level. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mila. I will just um, uh, spend two minutes of your time uh, uh, about uh, uh, widening these experiences. Uh, actually, it, it, this was a great example uh, where, where you have a clean slate of an institution that is not uh, even at all um, familiar with the RRI principles. Uh, their field of expertise is totally different. And then the, you had the open field to, to really implement it the way you want it. And uh, actually, uh, this institution, Faculty of Agriculture, was practically mimicking the uh, European Commission approach of top-down uh, approach of uh, what are the principles and you saw that the similar um, challenges uh, around all the Europe in, the, in what, just one institution when you force something uh, from top uh, uh, down people are uh, wondering what's my responsibility and uh, do I have any kind of initiative and there you saw that, that um, personal responsibility on your task is uh, uh, actually something that is really important but also practical steps on what to do. And we saw in the last decade that RRI uh, usually gets stuck in, in specific actions that you need to do and specific changes. And therefore institutional changes at uh, Faculty of Agriculture uh, are really um, inspiring 
for the other institutions at our university. And actually my task in the new project that, that uh, uh, is now going on code change is to transfer the experiences from one institution to the other 13 institutions from the same university to try to follow their path and uh, to learn from, from uh, what, what, uh, what was uh, being done. So I believe this is a really uh, good case of a specific um, story on how to do something that is so abstract on a concrete level. So far, yeah. Eric, you're muted. It always happens. Um, thank you very much, Peter and uh, Mila, for sharing your experiences with uh, implementing RRI in your university. I think uh, we have still uh, a little time uh, for uh, one or two questions to you. So I would like to invite uh, the participants to pose questions. And to give you some time, I have a, uh, to, to ask a question. I have a question. Um, I mean, what became very clear to me is on the one hand, this seems to be a kind of delicate balance between on the one hand, it needs this kind of intrinsic motivation by people that they want to, uh, that they want change, which is important as a, as a, as a, as a driver for change. But on the other hand is, um, uh, it is very important to have institutional support. Uh, so, how did you balance this, uh, or what is your experience with this, with these kind of contradicting forces? Because very often you have an intrinsic motivation, and the and the institution doesn't want to change, and then the institution wants to change, but then the individuals are resistant. So this has to go together. What were your experiences in that? Well, thank you. Good question. Well, uh, we were lucky. I think it went together in, in case of our institution. We only had a problem of uh, time and financial limits, but we had a, a real support of our management. They, they are uh, completely aware that we need to change something and that we have to introduce RRI or however you call it in, in, in the way in the way we function. So we had the support. Actually, uh, the initiative came from our management. It was our vice dean who initiated the whole process of forming our RI team. And we still have a great support and it really makes uh, the work much easier. Uh, because whenever we want to try something or to change something, we always uh, organize a meeting with the management and uh, get the idea of how to do it because it's very hard to define the way of introducing those changes you know mm -hmm. yeah, if i may add uh, since i'm not an employee of their institution but i was a member of their meetings and i saw s such a heartless support of uh, their management uh, which which said uh, if you want to change, just let us know and it, it will be done. Uh, it basically required employees to come up with ideas and uh, you had the supporting management to help them with logistics. So it, it was really a good chemistry of two sides. Okay. Um, then I would like to ask Sophie, uh, who wanted to ask a question previously uh, about the norm uh, normative uh, aspect of RRI. Sophie, do, do you want to still to raise your question? Uh, yes, of course. It's just more like really a general question, um, which puzzled me about uh, about the um, yeah about your talk that uh, you mentioned that the shared vision of what is good for society would be required for uh, responsible research and innovation. And for me, it seems quite puzzling because it seems to be quite a big and really a normative question and a question which I think it's difficult to get an agreement on. So. Um, yeah, what have what kind of experiences have you made, and uh, maybe also what can we learn from it? And um, most importantly, what do you mean by that? I think this is a question not only for uh, Peter and Mila; it could also be uh, picked up by uh, by Especially Jens. Especially yeah. Jens, maybe. Yeah, Jens. Yes, well, yeah, I talked about this a bit uh, in my own presentation and in the, in the discussion after that. Um, 
it's uh, much easier to have uh, to achieve, I think, a shared vision in a, a smaller group of people like an organization than across an ecosystem where naturally different actors have different uh, interests. But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we cannot have some like uh, at a more abstract level, some kind of shared um, uh, ethical ideals that uh, that we can all agree on, and which will make it uh, easier to um, to work together across an ecosystem. But I think this ideal with the shared vision, which is important for the learning organization, as I explained, is one of those areas that are difficult to translate to RI, uh, to be honest. Thank you very much, uh, Jens. Um, I, I want to thank all the presenters uh, for their uh, talks today, which uh, I found extremely interesting. And, um, and I would like to uh, thank all the participants for uh, coming and uh, joining this session today. Uh, the next session will be tomorrow afternoon and we are going to deal with uh, research funding organizations and uh, what it uh, means for responsible research and innovation. So thank you very much for uh, being here and being at the final New Horizon conference and I'm hoping to see you uh, again tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And if you don't have time, uh, you can visit our website and on our website you can have a look at the RIX, uh, our virtual exhibition, where you can see a lot of information about pilot actions we developed and uh, about the New Horizon projects. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.